Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Please take your Bibles with me this morning and let's open to the Psalms. Psalms. And we're going to look at the 67th Psalm here this morning. Psalm 67. And why don't we stand this morning just one more time. Praise the Lord. I feel like I've already had a workout today. This praise has been incredible today. There's just such an atmosphere in this, in this room. It's, it's incredible. Praise his name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. As you're turning there to the Psalms, I just want to let you know that the Psalms were the songbook of the Old Testament. And this is what Israel used as they worshipped God in their tabernacle first in the wilderness and and in the temple, uh, of course, they didn't have all the psalms that they have now, but this is the worship that they gave God in the temple. David penned many of these psalms, and uh, it's, it's a songbook. It was a, a songbook that was there to lead the people in worship, and, and God's people love to worship Him. The people of God always love to worship God, and many of these psalms and songs of praise they declare the greatness and the power of His excellence. And if you ever go through a dark season of the soul, let me tell you what will feed your soul are the Psalms. I have learned early and I have learned often that when I'm, whenever I'm going through a difficult season in my life, I break open that songbook and I break open that psalm and I begin to read because there's something there for us. Always. I have never come up short I've never been disappointed when I've come to, into the Psalms. Amen? We read here in Psalm 67, God be merciful to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. Boy, doesn't that sound like the blessing that Aaron was giving? May God's name be put upon us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. Verse 2, that your way might be known on the earth, your salvation among all nations. Let the people praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. O let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you shall judge the people righteously and govern the nations on the earth. Boy, isn't that a needful reminder today as we look at a world that is in trouble and a world that is as constantly in change that it is God who governs the nations. It is God who governs the nations. Verse 6, Then the earth shall yield. I'm sorry, verse 5. Let the peoples praise you. As if we needed to be reminded many times already in this psalm. This is the third time. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let, the peop let all, everyone say all. all. Let all the peoples praise you. Then, everyone say then. then. The earth shall yield her increase. God, our God, shall bless us. This is a psalm of doxology and invocation. It was a psalm used at the beginning and at the end of the worship of the Israelites. And it's a psalm of blessing. And we thank God for his blessing. Father, this morning we thank you for your word. And we thank you that you have gifted us and enabled us as your people to praise your name. Father, this morning we pray that through this message, your name will be amplified and exalted. We pray that your name would be lifted up on high because we as your people, we value you. We treasure the name of God this morning. We treasure the presence of Jehovah. We thank God that he is our rock and our fortress and we shall never be moved. Hallelujah. We thank you that you are present with us at all times and at all seasons. Bless and anoint this word. Father, impart faith to us that we may act upon it and that, Lord, you may be blessed through it, for we give you thanks for your word is eternal, and it is powerful, and we thank you that it is anointed, and it breaks the rocks to pieces, and, Father, we thank you that it melts our hearts. 
Father, once again, let your word come forth with power and demonstration. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You can be seated this morning. As you look into the Psalms, and as I want to encourage you, last Sunday when we came together, I preached a message entitled, Why We Sing. And I believe this morning that a saved people should be a singing people. We sing because we respond to the revelation of who God is. Many of these psalms were penned as a result to some aspect of who God was, whether it was because he was the God above all nations, whether or not because he was a deliverer for the people of Israel, whether or not because he was their healer and their rock. These are the things that were written about in the psalms, and they are always showing forth their, 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 the joy that God brings to his people when we understand his goodness and when we understand how glorious he truly is. Now, to, to get the full impact of this message, I believe that each of us individually need to receive from the Lord a revelation that will open our eyes to see beyond what we've seen thus far. How many of you know that there is always more to God than what we've come to understand thus far. Because God's ways are, are far beyond our understanding. God is so much bigger than we are today. And I'm thankful that he reveals his secrets to those who seek for him. Secret number one, if you seek for God, the Bible says if you hunger and you thirst for his righteousness, there is a promise in his word that you shall be filled. Hallelujah. And I want us today to understand the power of praise. When we are a people that exalt, to praise means to lift up. It means to magnify. And just like the musicians plug into amps, when we begin to call upon the name of the Lord, we begin to amplify the name of God in the earth. And let me tell you, there's power in that name. And I pray that we as God's people would understand that if we are a people of praise, that God has called us to amplify God's goodness and God's glory and God's presence wherever we go. And no matter what season of life we're in and no matter what we're going through, right, Sister Helena? God is the one that gets the glory. You can be going through cancer right now and you could be getting treatments for this or that and guess what? God is still good and he's worthy to be glorified. Now as we read this psalm and as we look at this psalm this morning and indeed it reminds us if you want to turn with me back to Numbers chapter 6 it does have its roots in the Aaronic blessing. It's reminding us that when the priests came together that God commanded them specifically how to how they were to praise the Lord. How many of you know that God has a way that he wants us to, to praise him? You just don't come before the Lord any old way. We reverence his name and we hallow his name and we revere his name. And as we look at this, it says in Numbers chapter 6 and verse 24, this is what Aaron and his sons would speak over the people, saying, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. What was this Aaronic blessing about? It was simply about putting the name of God, where? On every person. As they spoke the blessing, the blessing was to be upon every person in the assembly. I want you to know today that you're blessed. And if you know Jesus, you're blessed by God. God has put his name upon your life. If you have been saved by his grace, God has blessed you and he has placed his name upon you. Now let me tell you, if you have received the name of God upon your life, then you have also understand that when God puts his name upon you, he takes ownership of you. And this is where some of us need to wake up and understand that this is no small thing. When God places his name upon you, it's because he has ownership of your life. That means that we have to surrender to him, not in some things, but in everything. 
Because as we have discovered and as you will learn as you grow in your faith that worship is more than songs and singing. Worship is the worth that we give to God from our hearts. Years ago we used to sing, I'm coming back to the heart of worship because it's all about you, Jesus. Remember that song? I love that song. The heart of worship. You see, you don't worship God just with your mouth only, and you don't worship Him only just with instruments, but you worship God when you give Him the worth from your heart. That means that words, it's not just words on your mouth, and that's what I just, I, I get lost in worship when we're able to tune out everything and everyone and just have one focus on Him. Let me tell you, it transports you into another realm. It brings you into another place. I'm just explaining to you from my own experience. When some of us have not yet understood what it means to praise God and worship, you're missing a blessing. You're missing a blessing. And God said to Israel, here it is. I'm placing my name upon you. Verse 27 says, so they shall put my name on the children of Israel and I will bless them. Everyone today, you have been blessed to be a blessing. Tell someone today, you've been blessed to be a blessing. If God's name is on your forehead, if God's name is on your heart, if God's name through His Son Jesus is over your, over your soul and over your mind, you are a blessed individual today. As we look in this, when you receive the ownership of God, it's not just for a selfish reason, it's for God's reason. And verse 2 tells us why God put His name upon you in the first place. So that His way might be known in the earth. God has blessed you not to just so that everything would go well in your life and that you would never have a problem. God blessed you so that you could become a source of blessing to those within the sphere of your influence. God has blessed you even if you're the only believer in your family. God has blessed you there to be a blessing to those who don't know Him. You may be the only student in school who knows Jesus and you may say, well, it's lonely being here. Well, let me tell you, God has blessed you to be in that school to be a blessing to those who don't know Him. I have this plaque on my, on my, on my dining room, and it was one of our youth did this artwork, and it says, faith doesn't make things easy, it makes them possible. Some of us don't realize that you are still blessed even though you're under stress. Because I'm learning that God wants to hitch up our faith to something that may look to us as impossible because that's the realm in which God works. And that's in which the realm that faith becomes operative. If you don't have a need for God in your life, then faith will never move the mountains. But when you've gone through something and when you've experienced something of difficulty, you have a testimony in your life because God proves to you and to others that my name is there. That this one belongs to me. And it doesn't matter what the doctor says, his name is still on you. And it doesn't matter what the trial may look like, his name is still upon you. And when you receive the ownership of God in your life, no matter what comes your way, and no matter what you face down, and no matter what is staring you at the nose, let me tell you, God is going to show up because His name is there. I love it. I love it. I love it. That your way might be known on the earth, and not only His name, but His salvation to all people. God saved us so that we could go and rescue others. God saved us because His heart is not for some people, but for all people. I thank God that we live in a church like this, and I, I'm, I'm deviating from my notes, but I have to tell you, I had an experience this week. I had the privilege of, of going to a, a, a campus here, right here in New Jersey, Rutgers College. We support a ministry there called Chi Alpha, and uh, Brian Adams is the leader, and we support him on a monthly basis. And, and Brian wanted me to just get together with him and to see that God is stirring something in the youth and in our young people there. 
the college ministry of Chi Alpha has now more than doubled in size. They have more than uh, twice as many life groups going on a weekly basis on five different campuses where four and five young people are getting together in their dorm rooms to do Bible study and to pray for one another. And they're praying now for a campus-wide revival on Rutgers University. I don't know about you, but when I went with him to various locations, we began to, I began to feel like a, a presence of God coming down on me. And I could sense that God is stirring something. And I'm witnessing with my eyes that God wants there to be an outpouring of his spirit in a secular campus called Rutgers University. Because the greatest minds, the nerdiest minds of the state of New Jersey assemble there. But how many of you know that God could bring transformation on a college secular campus of Rutgers University? Then great things are about to happen. And I'm believing that God is going to do that and so much more. I thank God that what started as a school years ago, as a school of ministry, God can once again visit and bring revival on a college campus of Rutgers University. And why do I say all of this? I say this because we have so many of our students here at home who are attending this, this ministry. And Brian is sharing with me the sad news that so many of our AG churches that send children there to Rutgers University, he even shared this with me, some AG pastor's kids have fallen into sin while they're on campus and they're still leading worship in their home churches. Unless there is a realization of the ownership of God in our lives, when our children grow up and graduate and they leave us, the enemy's snatching the fruit right from out underneath of us. And I thank God that he has raised up a special generation. I believe that the young people who are there now from this church, many of them are life group leaders, many of them are leaders leading the movement. And he said to me, Pastor Greg, I don't know what it is that Matuchin is doing, but it's different than the other churches. And I would love in my flesh to be able to take credit for that, but I can't. Because I know it has nothing to do about me. I know it has to do with the families that have poured into these children. And I believe it's the opportunities that we have given to these children for them to excel and to know the ownership of God on their lives. You see, if we just have our kids in JBQ and knowing information without transformation, they're still going to be lost. But when they have ownership for their faith and they know that their hearts belong to Jesus, they can go through anything and still come out on the other side. I got way off of where I was supposed to be. Oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy. See, this is where God has blessed you to be a blessing. And God has been blessing this church over the many, many years of its 51 years of existence. Come this November, it will be 51 years. God is blessing this church to be a blessing to the nations. It is not only a blessing to be in a church when you look around and you see representatives from different nations, but he has sent those nations to be a blessing to those nations. How many of you know, I can't reach everybody, but everybody can reach somebody. And you are here, not on happenstance, you are not here on accident. God has brought you here to be a blessing so that you could be a blessing to others. Let the peoples praise you, O God, and let the peoples praise you. How we express our praise. Well, let me tell you, Israel in the Old Testament learned to express praise with God through their whole hearts and with their whole being. You see, if what you come to understand about worship is just singing in song and it doesn't include your whole heart and it doesn't include your whole being, then you haven't praised God yet. Here's something that I love when I, when I look at these psalms and you read them. They praise the Lord. David praised God with enthusiasm. I hope that when you prepare yourself during the week to come to church, that you are looking forward to worshiping God. Do you? To be enthused about something or to experience enthusiasm, the word enthusiasm means this, intense and eager enjoyment. Does that describe your praise? Is it intense? Do you eagerly seek to worship and to praise God? To be enthused means to be intense and eager enjoyment, to have an interest or seek for approval. 
The synonyms of enthusiasm is eagerness, passion, and zeal. Do you have a passion for the Lord's presence? You know, that's how I pray before Sunday, and I thank God that, that more of you are coming out on Sunday morning to pray. And let me tell you, I love a church that's prayer conditioned. When you come in, you sense the presence of God. It's not hard for Lewis to lead in worship when, when this room has been prayer conditioned. But do you have a passion for his presence? I know I do. I have an eagerness and I have an expectation that when I come here, God is going to show up. And how I praise the Lord, it matters. Another way or another definition of enthusiasm is to be absorbed with or by a controlling possession of the mind. See, so see, our praise is affected here in our minds. When your mind is so focused on so many other things, it's hard to worry and worship God at the same time. That's why he says, cast all your cares on me. When you can leave your cares at the door, you can come in and worship God freely. Hallelujah. You can come and your worship is light. When you, when you learn to cast all of those things upon the Lord, you're able to do that more effectively. Worship is a lively interest. And that's what it means to be enthusiastic about worship, to have a lively interest. Now, I see people all the time, we get enthused about a lot of things. As a matter of fact, there's a, a group of guys, we have a, a volleyball tournament coming up on, on Saturday. And I love it because uh, we have this app now called the WhatsApp. And, and the guys who are getting into the volleyball thing are sending now videos about the how-tos so that we as a team can get better. There's an enthusiasm that is starting to flow among our team members where now they're eating, sleeping, and thinking about volleyball. There's an evident enthusiasm when we come together and practice now because we want to put into practice what we just learned. And I have to laugh because a lot of these instructional videos make it look so easy. And then when we try, we look really foolish out there. But we don't care. There's an enthusiasm because there's an excitement. Because not just because we want to win, but together we want to accomplish something. That by ourselves we could never accomplish. And, and if you want to come and root for your team, by the way. I'm sure there's going to be some information on, on Saturday. It's not going to, it's going to be up in Hillsboro. But we're, we're going to just have a good time. But we're enthusiastic about it because during the week, we don't just let a week go by. We're, we're looking for ways to improve ourselves. And praise God, he's, he's helping us. Amen? I like what Martin Lloyd-Jones says. He says, a dislike of enthusiasm can be one of the greatest hindrances to revival. Did you hear me? Sometimes people came from backgrounds where there weren't much enthusiasm in the worship service. And I get it. I understand. There's a place for a reverence and a holy, holy uh, experience with God. And not every personality is alike either. Some people are quiet and reserved. And there's a place for that too. But let me tell you, there is something about worshiping God that goes just beyond just singing when it involves your whole being. Something about that changes on the inside and compels us to do things that we normally wouldn't do. Just like when you're there at a team sport event and, and when the, when the uh, underdog team comes back from a deficit and they're able to score in the final moments without instruction, what happens to the crowd? Enthusiasm overtakes them and what do they do? They jump up to their feet and they holler, wow! Who told them to do that? Nobody. It became something that rose up from the inside of them and they expressed it without anyone telling them to do so. God has a spontaneous worship that, that he loves when his children can give back to him spontaneously. We've been looking in these last couple of weeks at a book I, uh, I shared with you last week entitled Holy Roar by Chris Tomlin and Darren Whitehead on the seven Hebrew words of praise. These seven words can possibly change the way that each of us worship. And today are the hands of praise. I want to share with you, God has equipped us with hands to praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Can you lift up holy hands this morning as a wave of praise to the Lord? Hallelujah. God loves our praises. Hallelujah. The hands of praise is the word yada. It means to revere or worship 
with extended hands. Psalm 67 and verse 3 says this. We just read it. Let the peoples yada with extended hands to praise the Lord with giving of thanks. That's what you see when, when, when you read this psalm again now, we see the word yada means to revere him, to extol him, to amplify him in worship through the raising of hands. It also means the same expression, to throw a stone or an arrow. To give thanks is to praise him. It's mentioned over 120 times in the scripture. The first place that it's mentioned is in Genesis 29, verse 35. It says that Leah, when she conceived and bore a son, said this, This time I will yada the Lord. I will praise the Lord. Therefore, I will call his name Judah. The word yada appears 70 times alone in the Psalms. And in Psalm 145 and verse 10, it says this, All your works, Lord, will yada, will praise you. All of God's works will lift up hands to him. All of God's creation will magnify and give him thanks. For it goes on to say, your faithful people extol you. In this psalm, David declares that God's people cannot but help to raise their hands for the faithfulness of God. And Psalm 67, as we've read here, we, we see how God has blessed the people to be a blessing. And you know, when you raise your hands, it's like raising your heart. I, I get lost in worship. I don't know if anybody notices, but I'm, I'm on the front row where I can't look at nobody else. And I don't want nobody else distracting me when I'm worshiping God. And if I look foolish to anyone, I look foolish to him. You can only see the back of my head. But I love the Lord, and I get lost in worship when, when I understand that my life is not my own, but he has given life to me. There's an ownership there. There's, there's something that, that builds and builds in worship. And I said it last Sunday. It's like those old TVs that I grew up with that my son reminded me, Dad, you're from the 1900s. Boy, that makes me feel old when he says that. But it's true. When I grew up, we didn't have all this cable and, and all this live streaming. We didn't have the internet and all that stuff. When, when we want to watch a program, we had those things on the TV called rabbit ears. Remember those things? And it'd be like in the middle of your program, the picture would get snowy. And you have to go, somebody had to get up there and reposition those things, right? If you wanted better reception, you had to move the rabbit ears. Well, I feel like it's that way sometimes for some of us in worship. Some of us are so self-conscious about ourselves that we wouldn't dare raise a hand up. But I, I want to challenge you that I believe you get better reception. I believe that you might feel something when you're not so self-conscious about who's looking at you. And just like the woman who said in the crowd, if I could just but touch him. There's something that is powerful about our praise. That when we hold it back, we are missing out on a greater blessing. I believe that there's something remarkable when God's people collectively together begin to yada the Lord, begin to praise him. I believe that there's a power that goes out. As a matter of fact, Satan hates when you worship the Lord. He wanted worship for himself. And so be careful if you're too self-conscious about your worship or your praise. David became undignified when he took off those royal robes. And the Bible says he danced with his heart. Let me tell you, there was no dance moves on the planet that could match when the Spirit of God came on a person like David. And the Bible says he danced heartily, mightily as unto the Lord. Because the joy that overtook him that God's presence was coming back with the ark into the, into the temple. David danced mightily unto the Lord. There are so many different kinds of natural expression that we can give to God in praise and in thanks. In Psalm 44, verse 8, it says, In God we make our boast all day long. We praise Him. We yada His name forever. Psalm 44 and verse 8. And this is what I love the most. God's praise is not limited to Sunday only. 
Now, I love the way Brother Lou leads worship, but guess what? It's not just Brother Lou that blesses God. It's when you praise Him. It's when you lift up holy hands. It's when you give thanks unto His name. It's when you exalt Him and, and, and give Him the glory that is due Him. The hands of praise, I believe, is important for us to understand because it's a sign of our surrender. It's an acknowledgement back to Him that He owns us. That we are reaching beyond ourselves and we're moving towards His glory. We want to receive a, a greater blessing. Hallelujah. God wants to not just uh, have us to be blessed, but He wants to pour out greater blessings. And this is what I've come to find in worship that I believe is a secret. The more that I give, the more I receive. Oh, you thought that was about money only, didn't you? How many of you know that the more that you give God, the more that he pours back in? That's why when I, I look forward to worship now than maybe any other time when you don't understand that, when you think it's just about the song and when you get lost in worship and you begin to raise up hand and you begin to bless God and extol him and lift up holy hands, guess what? It's no longer about you. It's all about him. It's about acknowledging, reflecting back the goodness that he's already sent your way. It's redirecting it back to him and extolling him. And how many of you know that the more you pour out, the more he pours in? It's, it's a principle with all of life. In the lifting of hands, I came to understand as a young person that that's what lifted my heart. When I could kill my self-consciousness about who was looking at me and whether or not somebody would make fun of me, that's when the blessing really began to, to just ignite in my life. Lamentations 3.41 says, Let us lift up our hearts and our hands to the God of heaven. Through the simple act of lifting up your hands, you're lifting your heart to him. Because how many of you know what you worship you love? And what you love, you worship. And if you really love him, you worship. It just comes naturally, it comes easy. It flows from an attitude of gratitude. And I was reminded about this again and again when we think about the goodness of the Lord. We can praise God for so many things. We can praise him this morning. As I shared with you, another Hebrew word of praise is that of the halal or to the word that, that we transliterate that comes into the word hallelujah comes from the Hebrew word halal, which means to boast, to rave, or to shine. It means to celebrate. And it means clamorously foolish. I just talked about David. And where, where you get a picture of halal, you can see it when, in, at a Hebrew wedding. When they, when they get together and they link up arms to arms and they began to dance, you can imagine this in Scripture, the halal uh, of worship, when the Levites, by the hundreds, came with their instruments and they stood before the assembly in the temple and they began to declare the name of God. And as the praise began to build, the halal, or the praise of God, the exalt, they began to dance before the Lord. And as they began to dance before the Lord, guess what? The people shouted praise unto the Lord. They began to shout and became even clamorously foolish in their worship, which simply means they were no longer self-conscious, but became exuberant and spontaneous and lavish in their praise for God. Let everything that has breath halal the Lord. Do you know that's how the song book ends? Psalm 50 ends with this word of praise, the halal. Let everything, let, let's read Psalm 150 because it's a powerful psalm. It's the capstone to everything else that was written. It's the conclusion, the climax to everything that was penned before it. In Psalm 150, it says, Praise Him in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty firmament. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. Amen. Praise Him with the lute and the harp. Praise Him with the timbrel and the dance. 
Praise him with the stringed instruments and the flutes. Praise him with the loud crashing cymbals. Praise him with the clanging cymbals. Let everything, let's say that together, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let me tell you, this is where your attitude and refocus can change. As we begin to praise the Lord, we're praising from an understanding of who he is and what he's done for us. Our praise is not about us. That's why I can get through this controversy about music in the church. Can I be honest with you today? I believe that God wants to pour out an intergenerational blessing upon the house. That God wants not just us to praise the Lord, but how many of you know that he wants children to praise the Lord? In fact, the Bible goes a step further that Jesus reminded those who are critical about him on the day of his triumphal entry when they began to praise aloud that hosannas to the Lord, they became indignant about the praise that was coming forth that Jesus said to them in Matthew 21 and verse 15 when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things that he did and the children shouting in the temple court, Hosanna to the son of David, they became indignant. And he said to one another, verse 16, do you hear what the children are saying? There's something about this that caught their attention, what the children were doing. Let me tell you, if our children catch this and begin to praise God at an early age, they're going to have ownership of who God is in their life. They're going to know that God owns them early. There's something about a praise of a child that is innocent and yet inviting to Abba Daddy that he loves when children praise him. Because Jesus responded to them and said, Yes, Jesus replied, Have you not read from the lips of children and infants, You, Lord, have ordained praise to come forth. Hallelujah. God has ordained children to praise him. And Psalm 8, verse 2, it says, Though the, the praise of children and through infants, you have established a stronghold. You know what? Spiritual war takes place when children praise the Lord. It says a stronghold. He establishes a stronghold against the enemy, the enemy when children praise God. Now, if you're a young person seated in the room, I know most of them left. You're our most valuable asset. If our children will grow up Praising God not just on Sunday, but Monday and all the week through, guess what? Satan is going to lose, and he's going to lose big. A child who can praise clamorously foolish and not be concerned about the, uh, the, the eyes looking upon them, there's something about that praise that is so sincere that, it, that it, it blesses the heart of God. Let me tell you, our praise is all about reflecting God's goodness. The Bible gives us so many different reasons why we can praise the Lord. I want to just share a few with them with you in closing today. You can praise the Lord because he is your salvation. Can you thank him for that? You can praise him this morning because he is your Lord of Lords. You can praise him no matter what you're going through because in the end he is faithful to his promise. How many of you can thank him for that? You can praise him because there is no one else that is like him. Hallelujah. You can praise him because the Bible says you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You can praise the Lord because he is a God who is compassionate. Hallelujah. You can praise him because he is your peace. You can praise him because he is your rock and your fortress. You can praise him because he is good. You can praise him because he is your strength. You can praise him because he is faithful. You can praise him because he protects. He protects from evil and he protects from the evil one. Hallelujah. You can praise him because he is mighty. Hallelujah. You can praise him because his way is perfect. You can praise him because daily, hallelujah, daily he bears my burdens. Hallelujah. You can praise him because he is close to the brokenhearted. You can praise him because his deeds are marvelous. You can praise him because his glory is greater than all the others. You can praise him because he does not treat us as our sins deserve. You can praise him because the Bible says his love is unfailing love hallelujah 
You can praise Him because His splendor is more splendorous than any other. Hallelujah. And His light shines to the eternal ages. You can praise Him because He heals your disease. Hallelujah. You can praise Him this morning because He still is the Lord of Lords and He is the King of Kings. You can praise God because He is the God of all comfort. You can praise Him because He is merciful. You can praise Him because He turns the darkness into light. Hallelujah. These are just some of the reasons why you can praise the Lord today. You can praise Him because He's the creator of all things. And this is why I praise Him. Because He's coming soon. I want to tell you today, if you want to praise the Lord, get up on your feet today. And let's give the Lord a clap of praise in the house. Hallelujah. We want to praise you, Lord. We want to praise you because you're good. We want to praise you because you're great, oh God. You are worthy at all times, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to keep on praising the Lord. Because the power of our praise defeats any discouragement. The power of your praise changes any kind of attitude. The power of your praise sets you up to a greater promise. And it gives you access to God's power. Because when you become a conduit, guess what? Power begins to flow through your life. When you begin to praise God, it's like turning that light switch on on the wall. The moment before it was turned on, there was no power. But the moment that that switch gets turned up, the moment that that switch inside of your soul begins to perk up and your hands begin to go up and you begin to give God the glory that is due His name, the atmosphere around you begins to change. It's high time that the church stops becoming a a thermometer and we become a thermostat. Stop reacting to what's going on around you and start tapping into what God has for you. It happens when you praise God. It happens when you are clamorously foolish. It happens when you give up holy hands and thanks to the Lord. I'm telling you, church, I'm excited because great things are about to happen. Great things are going to happen in your week when you're not going to just forget what you heard about here on Sunday, but what you carry forth in you, when you understand that God's name is on your life, when He has blessed you to be a blessing, you're not going to stay silent anymore. You're going to be like those that are on the road on, on that day of His triumphal entrance saying, Hosanna to the King. I ain't going to let no rock outshine my place of praise I praise him because I love him I praise him because he's been good to me I praise him because I'm not deserving of his mercy oh man I pray that today with with me in this moment you would just close your your eyes and listen this morning I don't know what your situation is I don't know what struggle that you've been in, but I know that God can turn it around. I know that he'll begin to start visiting a soul that begins to throw the switch on, that becomes to step out of the way and get self out of the way and humbly acknowledge that you can't do it alone. You need him. And he wants to be there for you and he wants to show up in power And he wants to show up in healing. And he wants to show up in so many different ways. That the best way is that of surrender. The heart of worship begins with a heart of surrender. A heart of worship is a heart that is more like his. God, I pray to that one who came today discouraged, without hope, I pray that God something something is going to leap up on the inside as we begin to praise you. And as we begin to worship, Lord, today, God, that powerful praise is going to send the enemy fleeing. He's going to go screaming 
and, 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 and wailing because he is sick of hearing the praises of God's people. He doesn't want to be around it. He can't stand a, a thankful spirit. He, can, he can't stand a, a heart that's at, at peace with God. My Bible still says that God inhabits the praises of his people. And that doesn't have to be elaborate. And that doesn't have to sound pretty. It just has to be the cry of your heart. God, I want more of you. God, I want you to show up in ways unexpected in my life. God, today is the moment I'm reaching for it. I'm going for it. I, I want to have all that you want for me. Lord, I don't want to be satisfied with what I've got. God, if you've got something greater, I want it. God, if you've got something more, I want to have it. Lord, I don't want to just have water to wade in. I want to have water to swim in. Lord, I don't want to just take a bath. Lord, I want to go into the deep. I want to take a plunge, Lord. I want to go deeper with God. I want to be lost in the things of God. I want to experience the miraculous flowing through my life. If that's your heart, it begins there with just surrendering it to Jesus. Come to Him as you are. And let your heart match what you're doing and what you're singing. When your heart matches what you sing about and what you praise about, good things are about to happen. Father, we pray a blessing. I speak a blessing today over every person today. Lord, we place the name of God upon each one of them. It's in the name of Jesus that I bless every person in this room today. You have blessed them, almighty God, to be a blessing to others. Lord, let them understand more about your ownership in their lives that you've placed a great name and a great calling upon them. There's a great anointing that flows, Lord, when we understand what our rightful position is as your sons and daughters. Father, may we receive of your goodness today, grace for grace, mercy for mercy, Lord Jesus, strength for strength, O oh God. Manifest, O oh God, your presence once again and your glory in this house. Let your presence go forward. Let it go before us. Make a way, Lord. Defeat the enemies, Lord, that come against us. Lord, those who rise up, Lord, will fall in the name of Jesus. Those who speak evil against us, Lord, will be, will be cast out of the way. And God, that you will raise up a people who praise you and who reflect the glory that is due your name. Lord, we pray a blessing upon our children, oh God. Lord, in the name of Jesus, let this be the hour of an intergenerational blessing, oh God. Let the blessing, Lord Jesus, flow from heart to heart. Let this generation praise you and let the next generation see that we are all in for God, that we are all in for you, Jesus. Lord, let there be a blessing on our littlest and our least, O oh God, to our greatest, O oh Jesus. Bless the mouths of praise, O oh God. Let us ever be singing praise unto your name. For we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus.